Well, I hope you like the Proverbs of Hell and the Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Uh, some of these um, aphorisms are worthy of writing down a piece of paper and taping them on your wall uh, in your dorm or your apartment or your room at your um, parents' house, perhaps, given, given the quarantine. Uh, I remember reading these for the first time, Proverbs of Hell, uh, when I was probably your age, and they, they really turned me on. Some of those sentences are just fabulous. Uh, the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. Um, exuberance is beauty. Eternity is in love with the productions of, of time. Um, the fool who persists in his folly will become wise. Uh, the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Uh, these, these are fabulous, uh, sort of inspiring statements. But then you have these really odd sentences that seem to make no sense whatsoever. Um, like, the lust of the goat is the bounty of God. Um, what does that mean? The rat, the mouse, the fox, the rabbit watch the roots. What? The lion, the tiger, the horse, the elephant watch the fruits. So there are these nonsensical, almost surrealistic sentences that, that, that don't seem to, to have bear much meaning at all. And then some of the sentences are just downright disturbing, such as sooner murder an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desires. Really, you're gonna kill a baby in its crib um, rather than, than, than repress uh, desires. So that my point is that even though these Proverbs of Hell are, are scintillating, and we might be tempted to associate them with William Blake, um, in fact, they're, they're flawed and problematic. Uh, we, we can't say probably that this is the core of meaning and the poem is just one perspective and it's more exciting than the perspective of the angels uh, but in some ways it's just as problematic another way of thinking about contraries in the poem that that there's not a sense that hell is better than heaven and demons are necessarily better than angels but what i'm going to talk about right now is at the very end of the proverbs of hell this this voice yet again um, who may be the voice behind the poem who may be the voice of the apocalyptic passages early on has this really brief, powerful history of religion. And it goes like this. The ancient poets animated all sensible objects with gods or geniuses, calling them by the names and adorning them with properties of woods, rivers, mountains, lakes, cities, nations, and whatever their enlarged and numerous senses could perceive. And particularly, they studied the genius of each city and country, placing it under its mental deity, till a system was formed, which some took, of, some took advantage of and enslaved the vulgar by attempting to realize or abstract the mental deities from their objects. Thus began priesthood, choosing forms of worship from poetic tales. And at length, they pronounced that the gods had ordered such things. Thus, men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. Well, there it all is. In the beginning, imagine this race of, of giants with enlarged and numerous senses that could perceive the physical world with, with great acuteness and intensity. And when they did, they would name what they saw. They would give their perception a particular name. Um, so in this way, their perception was immediate, and the language that they chose to name these perceptions was closely um, woven into the experience itself. In other words, the language was very concrete. So we might see this as sort of a, an ancient race of heroic poets uh, with highly acute perception um, and immediate powerful language. But what happened? Um, over time, these immediate utterances became... Um, increasingly abstract to the point where priests came along and said that these words don't necessarily point to this particular experience of the poetic giant but these words are symbols of abstract principles and these abstract principles are gods that we ourselves must worship it goes like this um, imagine I'm one of these heroic giant poets <laughs> And I might see a, a, a golden wisp uh, coursing through the sky. And I say, eagle. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so at that point, eagle only means that particular experience. Um, and when I say eagle uh, to my other epic, heroic, giant poet friends, they know I mean that experience. 
But over time, this word eagle, as language becomes more abstract and as the priesthood takes over from the poets, eagle is not simply a marker of this concrete experience. Eagle becomes a marker of an abstract principle like Jove um, or, or Yahweh. Um, and at that point, the priest can say, look, the word eagle is given to us as a symbol of this divine principle. And what we should do when we see an eagle is not think about how it might connect to us in our particular experience. We rather should see this eagle as um, a representation of the God that we should be worshiping. So in, so in this way, in our current situation, we might say, um, we tend to believe that God is some divine being um, outside of space and time and that physical objects are somehow manifestations of this deity. Whereas Blake is here saying, let, let's call this um, unnamed voice Blake for convenience sake, is saying, no, deities reside in the human breast. We create gods. We make gods. When we have an intense experience and we name it uh, with powerful utterance, that is a divine experience. That is us creating a god, a deity. Uh, that's where religion comes from. Religions for Blake are myths that are mistakenly called religious systems. Now, of course, the priests want you to believe that these myths are actually religions because the religion has a divine authority, and if you don't follow the divine authority, uh, you'll suffer, you'll be punished, maybe you'll go to hell. Um, but if you see all religions as mental constructs, as, as poetic myths, if you see all religions in that way, what can you do? Well, you can criticize the religions around you because you can say it's just one more poetic myth, but also, and this is where Blake is really exciting, <laughs> you can create your own mythology. You can create your own religion, let's say, although we know in this case religion is myth. And Blake did exactly that um, in his later prophecies, which um, we're only looking at a little bit in the book of Urizen. He creates his own um, he creates his own gods, he creates his own goddesses, he creates his own landscape. He comes up with a whole new mythology.